Hello and welcome to the Limo Profit Show. I'm your host, Ed Stapleton Jr. And today I'm very excited to have as my guest, my friend, Bruno Teixeira. Bruno's been in the industry for about 30 years, and both as an owner for over 20 years, and then as a consultant, helping companies with their marketing. In fact, he's worked with over 100 limousine businesses. So this guy's got tons of experience, so I'm really excited to have him here for an interview. So let's get started. Hey, Bruno. Hello, Ed. How are you? Pretty good. Yourself? I'm doing well. Excellent. So let's get right into the interview. So why don't you tell me a little bit about how you got into this industry? Well, first of all, Ed, I want to thank you for having me. You're a great leader. You have inspired and touched and helped and mentored so many companies in the past. You're a great asset to our industry. So, I, you know, it's a great honor for me to be on the phone with you. My, I appreciate um, thank you. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's my pleasure. I started the business in 1986. I used to work for a five-star hotel, um, received a lot of high-quality training. I felt that I had the, the experience of working for uh, an expensive uh, hotel, and I would always see limousine companies come in and out of the front door, and, and I didn't think that they were meeting the level of expectations. So I bought a car and quit the job, and it's, it was an incredible journey from 1986 until 2009, and I enjoy every minute of it. Excellent. And then you, uh, right out of the gate, specialized in the, the hotel market? Yes. Our company was so uh, um, dedicated towards corporate and hotels that at one point there were nine hotels in, in our city, in, in the downtown area, and we had exclusive contracts with all nine of them. Wow, that's pretty impressive. So let me ask you a couple of questions about working with hotels. How does how exactly does that work? Do you typically have to pay commissions back to them? Do they handle the billing? Do you handle the billing? How does that work? There are uh, many different ways you can work with a hotel. You can simply work with standby and compensate the front-end people for short-minute referrals. You can be a preferred vendor that you will register with the hotel. You provide them all the documentation necessary, and they will provide some work to you. But the ideal situation and what we've been able to do for our customers in the past is to have an exclusive single source of transportation agreement where you give the hotel control. They know how transportation money is being spent. You create a profit center for them that they're not benefiting when an operator goes out of uh, the, you know, the hotel or a taxi, but you create a profit center for them. And then you also create service enhancements for their customers. You can do a landing page, have an in-house hotel transportation extension. You can do private labels. You can pra- place the hotel magazines inside of the cars. You can, uh, there's so many things that you can do to make sure that the transportation service that's being provided by the hotel is a reflection of their level of service. There are many other advantages for the stakeholder or the meeting holder. He has one contact, one source of transportation. Often he can place the charges on a master account. So hotels are wonderful business. Uh, I've been involved with the transportation company, and we were able to put together a pioneer agreement between a New York company and all 48 Omni Hotels in North America. So I think that's one of the hidden opportunities in the business is to be able to work with the hotel on a very high level as their exclusive transportation service company, profit center, service enhancements, control, and quality. Interesting. So considering that the majority of the market is one or two car operators, what advice would you have for a, a small operator that's looking to get into the hotel market? How would they, I mean, it seems like a pretty daunting challenge, everything you just laid out. Well, it looks great, but for a small operator, looks kind of intimidating. Where would you have them start? My business model is that do what you can with what you've got, but do it now. If you're a one-car operator, make sure that you have the best possible equipment, the best customer service, and approach the front door people and give them a commission. And if this is what you're able to do, then do it well. So once you start growing the business and getting more cars, you already have established relationships. And at one point, it's going to be much easier to reach out to the management and ask for a preferred vendor because you already have that established uh, relationship. So that's my suggestion. Work with as many hotels as you can, provide outstanding service, give them as much value as you can, and never compromise on your service. And then once you grow your business, it's just a matter of time, you will be able to reach out to them and, and, and ask for a preferred vendor or an exclusive agreement. Good, good to know. Okay, so let's go back to your business. business. What was the name of that? Limousine, uh, transportation business or the consulting business? I didn't hear you. The, uh, the transportation business, your limo company. It was called Continental Transportation Systems. Early in the yeah. 90s, we started under limousine, but that label uh, we needed to change. A lot of the companies did not want to be associated with the limousine company. 
You know, they didn't want the invoices to reflect limousines. That implies more luxury. So we changed it to transportation in order to attract more of the corporate Fortune 500 type of hotel. hotel gotcha. So you're looking at a message to market match and making sure everything aligns in your, in your messaging and your positioning, right? Correct. Okay. So at your peak, how large did you get that company? Uh, it was almost $5 million. For a marketplace, which is Fort Worth, it was pretty high. But a big portion of that were government contracts, which is other, it's some of the other hidden strict secret. You know, the United States government offers a number of opportunities for company in terms of defense contractors, uh, armed forces, and things like that. So a big chunk of that business was uh, government work, pharmaceutical work, and hotel work. Interesting. And how would someone get into the government side of it? That seems like another daunting challenge. Lay out a little path or a little groundwork for me, how someone would get into government contracts. Well, once you start driving some of their executives and, you you know, just an individual corporate client, you establishing relationships, you know. But also, uh, most of these companies must allow uh, vendors to apply for services, being a, a government agency. So you would call some of these companies, ask for their procurement department or their purchasing department, and tell them, I'd like to see if I can become a preferred vendor or an approved vendor. In some cases, they may have somebody add, but then you can ask them, whenever you bid out the business, can I be included on that? They'll give you a date. You follow up three months in advance. I know the bid is coming out. Are we included? And then get a company or a consultant or somebody that has knowledge in the industry to do a very professional RFP that will give you the greatest chance. And you call as many agencies as you can. It's just numbers. You do some, you get some. You do more, and you get more. And that's how we got the $800,000 a year account from the United States government, just bidding on the business. Interesting. And were the rates that they required, were they fair? Were they below market? How were they paying? Tell me a little bit more about that, how it actually worked on the back end. Well, the main uh, criteria was not pricing. They want quality. They want safety. You're dealing with defense contractors. You're dealing with foreign nationals that are coming in to train their pilots. You're dealing with, uh, you know, dignitaries that are coming in to buy airplanes, sometimes worth thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred million dollars. So they expect safety. They expect reliability. You cannot leave a general or a colonel waiting at the airport when he's coming here to purchase two billion dollars worth of equipment. Okay. So service, reliability. Being on time, it was the key. Interesting. Okay. For your limousine business, were you doing any farm-in work? Well, when we started, there was very little farm-in work. Uh, of course, the, you know, we're in a global economy, global commerce, so now it should be a big percentage of your business. It's, it's to establish uh, relationships with other companies, to have good working relationships, and it's a big part of your business. It should encompass 10, 15, or 20%. So, no, we were not doing then, but we did have some partnerships. When we had a group for a large, uh, a large group for a hotel, then we would work with our alliances and our friends in the business in order to meet our customer demands without having to buy more cars or hire more people in order to meet that demand. Gotcha. That actually segues to a good point. In my first episode, Matt and I talked about not buying vehicles until you're ready, kind of measuring out your fleet utilization. What's your take on when are you ready to, to purchase that next vehicle? Because literally, buying one extra vehicle could drown a company. So when is a good time for a company to go out and purchase that next vehicle? I'm really big in numbers, Ed. I'm a Six Sigma process manager. I always tell my customers, if you don't know it in numbers, you don't know much about it. And if you don't know much about it, you can fix it. If you don't know it in numbers, all you've got is an opinion. So you run KPIs based on industry benchmarks. A town car what's should be a, earning... What's a, what's a KPI? Key Performance Indicator. It's a report that, uh, you know, you measure on a weekly basis, a town car in our industry should be bringing 10,000. That's best in class in benchmarking. Uh, your average 5,000, baseline $2,000. So you evaluate that car's performance, how much money it's bringing you. And if there's no value, if you can replace that by farming out the work, then you sell the equipment. Something else that we did, it was very beneficial and helped our company to grow is that whenever we had an agreement with a pharmaceutical company or with a hotel, we would buy equipment at for the term of that agreement. We close a deal with the United States Air Force for a year, we buy four vans, and we finance them in a year. After a year, if the contract did not get renewed, we send them back. So we mitigated any possible risk as far as that. But measure the, the amount of money you bring it in. You know, Try to work the numbers within the industry, and if you see a pattern 
a month, two months, three months, then you need to sell the car. And sometimes you don't have to sell it. You just have to change for something else. And maybe that you're needing a van, you're needing a party bus. But, you know, keeping track of your numbers is key. Okay, so as a small offer, how would I go about keeping track of my numbers? What are some important numbers that I need to keep track of on a daily, weekly? What, you know, what metrics do I need to, to be tracking? You need to track how much uh, revenue the car is bringing. Okay. You know, at the and end of the week, uh, if it's a town car, you should have $2,500. And, and this, the numbers that I'm giving you are in journal terms, uh, you know, based on industry benchmark, which is $105 for an airport transfer, the cost of a town car. And it has a lot to do with your market segmentation as well. And maybe that you're catering to uh, celebrities and your average trip is $400. Or it may be that you're doing a lot of airport transfers because if you're doing airport transfers, your margins are fairly small. You're paying for fuel and toll. But when you're going out with someone for an evening and the cost is you know, it's much less than that. So yeah, most of operators have town cars. I would keep an eye on anything that goes be below $5,000 and then do a cost analysis. That's how much it cost me to run this car. That's how much money I made. If I did not have this car, did not have this monthly payment, this insurance, the maintenance to keep the car running, and if I was to use those resources to use one of my colleagues and just make a percentage of that, would I be better off? And often you'd be surprised that you can make more money outsourcing the jobs than keeping a car in the garage that's making you $2,000 a month. Right. I completely agree. And now you bring up a good point of, of outsourcing it to a friend or to a, to a local company in the market to help you do some overflow work. How do you build that relationship and what's stopping that friend or colleague from stealing your client? I know that's a big fear in the industry. How do you make sure that's not an issue? Well, if you're doing enough business, this will happen from time to time. But you have to have the framework of a company that has something in writing. We used to have what we call a farm out procedure manual. Someone would have to bring their car, we see it, we inspect, we get a copy of the insurance, and then they would have to sign on a dotted line. A confidentiality agreement, a non-compete agreement that has to be enforceable in a court of law. Once people understand that you're serious about it, then they will, they're more likely to, to uh, be respectful. But honestly, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's easy to tell who are the good operators and who are the bad operators. You know, the guys that have been in business for a long time, they have good equipment. Uh, I would say that people going after your business are not that many. Plus, you can do other things. You can do quality control calls, call your customers, you know, once uh, every um, every month or so, or send out a customer survey, and very soon you're going to find out who are the ones that are trying to get your customers. And if you ever lose a customer ad, it is my opinion that it's your fault. If you're taking care of your customer, if you're catering to their needs, you have good communication, and giving them good value, they will never go with anybody else. And if there's a problem, they'll let you know. So, you don't have to worry much about the guy taking your business. Just take care of your customers, and things will take care of themselves. That's great. Okay, so what are some other ways that you should be measuring a limousine business? For, for performance, financially, sales, just give me some metrics that you measure as a consultant for a limousine business, you know, to check its health, basically. Well, there's a huge uh, uh, difference between a large company and a small company. All right, let's stick with small companies. Let's stick with the operators under 10 vehicles right now, and then maybe we'll go to above that next. It starts with the budget. You'll be surprised at how many operators are out there that just look at the bank account. I met with an operator the other day that the only uh, measuring device he has is the report from the airport so he knows how many times he goes in and out of the airport. You need to have a budget. You need to be able to keep track of your finances. And if you see that something, if you're spending too much money in maintenance so you can perhaps buy a new car, but the key are numbers. You need to be able to evaluate at the end of the month and find out that those are my expenses, you know, that, that's my margin, and it's not enough. So then what do I need to do in terms of changing the business, the business model, in order to attract a, a higher-paying customer? You have to define right away your niche in the market. Are you a price company or are you a quality company? What I see often are companies that they're trying to be both. They're trying to be the best and the cheapest. And in order to be effective in delivering services, you have to be efficient in managing your finances because if you're not efficient, inevitably you're not going to be able to be effective in delivering services. So keep track of your books. Uh, there are other tools that you can uh, uh, evaluate in terms of measuring the cost per reservation. Those are a little more sophisticated, but you know how much a reservation should cost you, $4, $6, or $8. And I always try to maximize your resources if you're not that busy and you don't want to lay off somebody, then instead of having them spending half a day on Facebook or texting, 
make sure that they have a full agenda, that they're calling affiliates, that they're doing customer surveys, that they're reaching out to new prospects, that they're doing more so that they can self-fund their part of the business. You know, a reservation agent could pay for her salary three times fold if you know how to maximize her time. Good. Okay. And what would you say to the operator that says, and this is something I hear a lot, I'm not a numbers guy, or I don't know how to keep track of that. Well, why is that important? I just know that rides are coming in and then things are looking up or feeling up. What, what do you say to that? Well, a big part of your business needs to be, you need to work on your business instead of your business. It's okay when you work in your business, you're washing the cars, you're driving the customers. But if you work on your business and you spend an hour a day to evaluate You know, this is my car payment. This is how much I spend in fuel. This is my profit margin. What can I do to change? For things to change, our strategies have to change, Ed. If you do the same things you've done before, you're going to get the same results. So there is some resistance to the operator that, well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. But then you should expect things not to change for you. You must embrace some sort of of, a, of an accounting type of report, keep track. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to grow your business. You need to define that I'm going to spend 4% in marketing so that this month is a little slow, then I'm going to reduce that and I'm going to change that. I know it's not easy, but uh, there are resources everywhere. All of us should buy you know, a book called Accounting for Dummies or Marketing for Dummies. Just spend some time educating yourself. If you invest in your business, you make a good living. You invest in yourself, you can make a fortune by becoming a person that can lead, can inspire, and can manage a profitable business. So, yes, self-development is key, and that's the only thing that's going to change for you. That's great. That's great to hear. Absolutely. I didn't take advantage of my college experience in terms of learning, but now I read three or four or five books a month, and I I can't put them down. I love reading and learning and continuing education. So it was definitely a defining moment for me when I started picking up books and reading again. So let's move on to the question of what would you measure if you were a, instead of a small company this time, let's go to, say, a midsize, you know, somewhere up into the 10 to, 10 to 50 car range. What numbers are you looking at? What metrics are you looking to measure? Well, there's certain standards in our industry. We know that the cost of a reservation should be no more than $6. You get the total amount of money that your reservation department makes. You divide that by the number of reservations. Let's say your monthly cost for your reservation agent is 5000 You did 5,000 runs, then it costs you $1 per reservation. Now you're able to determine what needs to be done in your business. If your cost is $4, that's great. If it is $2, that means, wow, it's too low. Perhaps I don't have enough people, staff to handle our client needs. You know, the numbers don't lie. They're just, they're facts. If the cost is too high, where, you know, $8 for each reservation, that means I'm overstaffed. I mean, if I'm overstaffed, I can either lay somebody off or I can maximize their efforts by having them do other things, cross training, do bookkeeping, write checks, and things like that. But if you do not measure in numbers, you will not be able to fix anything. All you got is an opinion. And you may get lucky for a while, but eventually it's going to impair you and it's going to prevent you from growing your business. So if you need to get a consultant or an accountant, you need to have a defined budget for your business. And you need to, to measure, you need to adapt, you need to change. But numbers are the key in growing any type of businesses. Okay. And what mistakes are you seeing that companies in, like, say, the 10 car range, what mistakes are you seeing them make that isn't allowing them to get to the 20 or 30 car range? Lack of marketing. Right. And often, if there's a marketing initiative, it's uh, one dimension. Everyone appears to be in love and it's obsessed with online search engine optimization. Some of those large companies now are telling that you should put every penny. And I am really surprised by the number of clients that I have that are losing money and they're not doing anything about it. They're engaging on long-term, six, eight, ten months agreements for search engine optimization. They're not getting any results. Of course, they feel good about it because, oh, yes, I'm doing some sort of a marketing. But can you imagine, Ed, in New York, if everyone uh, wanted to be in the first page? I mean, how big that first page would have to be? So I wrote an article for Limousine Digest recently that I said, while everyone is trying to park their limousines on Google's first page, Everybody else is driving by using some of the offline strategies that happen to build the most dynamic, the most incredible, the wealthiest country in the world, which is the USA. The Internet is 10 years old. It's been used effectively for marketing and, you know, and sales. 
in the past five years, but you know, this dynamic economy was built with the phone, with an email, word of mouth. Sometimes you just have to knock a few doors. And it is, uh, uh, it is clear that the internet and uh, you know, uh, technology should be the main hub of all our marketing efforts, but it should not be. And this is by far the biggest mistake that I see people making is not that they should not spend the money, but that they should have a little more balance. I say don't put all your eggs on Google's basket because you may be in for a big surprise. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's talk about your marketing company as a marketing consultant. What, what's the name of that business? Limousine Expert. Gotcha. And that's limousineexpert.com. Tell me about that business. Tell me what you do for a business. Who's your ideal client? What kind of results you look to do for them? What you actually do for them to, to get those results? We're a marketing agency. Our goal is to be able to implement strategies that will allow them to gain more customers and gain more runs. It's a fairly simple concept. We have the strategies, well-balanced strategies that we cater to different marketplaces, different type of customers, uh, a different type of prospects. So there's an initial interview that we meet uh, with the customer, and we find out if uh, it's something that's beneficial for the customer. And then we ask them to hire us for 30 days, just like you hire a director of sales. He was going to come in, he's going to find out about your business, and then he's going to say, you know, it is best that we go after hotel business. No, perhaps events will be a little better. Or maybe we can do an email marketing blast for 20,000 customers. So our goal is to implement strategies that will allow the operator, whether if you have one car or 100 cars, to grow their business by getting more customers. And it is amazing the number of companies that do not have a marketing effort. And I always tell people that the, 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 the richest companies, the ones that have the most money, are not always um, the best companies. You know, they, ha- they have to have good quality service. But I think you said that, and I'm going to quote, I think you said that the best companies are not, are not the best cars or the best drivers, but are the ones that have the best marketing. You know, if, they are equal, if they are equal to other companies, that's the key variable, you know, is to be able to market your business. And, and it's clear to me that companies that are doing well are the ones that have a consistent marketing effort. Absolutely. Yeah. The owner's key position in that business should be driving revenue. That's their goal. You know, no one else is going to step up and do that for them. So I 100% agree with that, that marketing is the number one priority for a business owner. So what are some things a owner can do with their current database of clients to maybe get a surge of business? We have a strategy that's simple. Uh, This is what we call the low-hanging fruit. It's the easiest customer. You can call a customer, thank them for their business, ask for some feedback, you know, simply by saying we're happy um, that you're our customer. Are we meeting your expectations? Is there anything else that perhaps we can do to better serve you? And the customer is going to let you know. If he has a complaint, listen. Don't put it on autopilot. Try to fix it. And then you can ask him, who else in your company uses transportation that perhaps can benefit from our services? I mean, is is there a travel department that handles that? And people will give you names. And then once you call, of course, you already have established credibility. You already drive someone from the company. And it's easy to get a new customer. And it's the most powerful strategy that anybody can use. It's good public relations. It shows the customers that you care. It shows the customer that you're a growing company, that you're looking for, for new customers. And obviously, the more customers you have, the more efficient you have, the, the more availability you will have. And I have customers, and they have databases of 20,000 20, customers, and they don't call on anybody. So wow. it, I think it's very important to do that. You can also do that by doing a survey, you know, sending someone a survey and ask them, you know, how's the service? Is there anybody in your company that could perhaps benefit from the services? And it's just numbers. You do the numbers. You do some, you get some. But it's a very, very good step. Now, what would you say to the limousine business owner that is fearful or hesitant to pick up the phone and actually call clients? Telephone call is a skill, and you can learn. The more able you are, the more trained you are, the less phone reluctance you will have. You need to be ready to overcome objections. And that's what people are, are afraid so if somebody asks you, well, we don't need anybody else. We already have another car company. Well, that's wonderful. That's great. May we be your second choice? You have an answer for that objection. You see right away. Oh, how much are your prices? We'll match prices for comparable services anywhere in your area. So you need to be able to overcome objections. And it's just numbers. We know that if you make 100 calls, you will get one customer. That customer, if it's well taken care of and well developed, will lead you to two more referrals. So the average, it's about $20,000 a year in revenue 
That's the value of that customer. If you make 100 calls, you're basically making $200 a call for your company. If somebody tells you, I don't want anything, I'm not interested, hang up, boom, I just made $200. You know, the closer you get to the next call, the closer you get to the next sales. And sometimes there is some pain involved. But if you want to grow a business, if you want to have a successful business, you need to reach out to the customers, to the prospects, so you can sell your business. There's no other way. Ed, I heard something interesting. Do you know how much uh, the McDonald's franchise sells in French fries a year? <laughs> I have no idea. A billion dollars. And you know what the wow. secret is? Upsell. You, of course, absolutely. You were the first person to answer that. You know, you, you drive in, I need a Coke. Can I get you some fries with that? If they didn't ask, would they sell a billion dollars? No. you got to ask. That's the only way. You know, you can't conquer the world and be home by 3 o'clock. To grow a business, you have to have the effort. And, but if, if you look at the outcome, you know, those calls are what's going to allow me to be home on a weekend, it's going to allow me to take two weeks off, that's going to allow me to lead an organization and grow an organization. So is it worth the time? That's your choice. For things to change, your strategies must change. And also right. what I've learned is that strategies don't fail. People do. And this fear of failure is what prevents them from doing. So I always tell people, don't let this punish you. Let it teach you so that you can invest in the future and have a better outcome. That's a great segue because my next question was regarding fear. I, fear. I feel fear holds many, many people back. A fear of success, fear of failure, fear of picking up the phone, fear of looking silly, fear of lots of things. So the fear is very rampant in our society and it's very poo-pooed and not talked about. So what's your take on fear and overcoming fear in order to become successful in business? Fear is what you see when you don't have a goal. It's something that gets on your way. If you have a goal that by the end of the year, I'm going to have an organization, I'm going to be able to provide a better lifestyle for my family, perhaps a private school for my kids, I'm going to have the best medical insurance, I'm going to be able to travel anywhere I want to, I'm going to be able to go home at 6 o'clock, and you envision the quality of your life, the benefits, why you started your business, and why you're self-employed, then you will overcome fear. And you know that because the end result is what you're looking for. And it's a choice. You have to make a choice to do what you need to do in order to grow your business. And like I said, Ed, it's a skill. You just practice and practice and practice, and then you become better and better and better. So let's talk about goal setting. What, um, both tangible and intangible, both you know, how you want your life to look and also monetarily, how do you help people set goals? The first thing that I tell them, regardless of your goals, keep in mind that the most important thing is that you must enjoy the quality of your journey. A goal, an objective, and success is not an end result. It's not having 20 cars and a million dollars in the bank when you're old and you don't have the health uh, to enjoy it anymore. So make realistic goals and also base your goals uh, in terms of your company. Where do you want to be? I mean, what's your market positioning? Do you want to be a little boutique limousine with five cars that caters to Jamie Foxx and Tom Cruise? Or you want to be a shuttle company that has 200 vans? And that's what's going to dictate in terms of goals and objectives. But it's really simple, Ed, and you know that. Get a piece of paper, decide what you want, decide where you want to go, decide who you want to help, decide what you want to learn, decide what you want to buy, and then start it. If you don't plan to have goals, you're going to plan to fail. I mean, if you fail to plan, you're going to plan to fail. I can assure you that. That's the most important ingredient, and I based all my life is setting goals and then pursuing worthy goals. Gotcha. Okay. Give me an example. Say, say a one or two car operator. What's an attainable goal that they could reach? Is it hitting $100,000 in revenue? Is it, like you said, being able to be home at 6 o'clock? How would a one or two car operator set goals? Give me some like specifics. Set realistic goals. I'm going to do some marketing based on what I'm able to. I'm gonna, when I drop off a customer at a hotel, I'm going to hand a business card. If I'm passing by one of my colleagues, I'm going to stop by and show them my car if they need any farm in work. So little steps, and okay, now I'm going to have another two runs a day. I'm going to be able to work with another companies and get more work and set benchmarks. Okay, I've gotten to 10 runs. Now I can buy a second car. After I buy a second car, the revenue is a little higher, so let me go ahead and hire somebody to answer the phones for me. Realistic benchmarks. But when you look at the future, you say a month from now, things will be different. 
Two months from now, things will be different. I'm doing something today that's going to generate income, that's going to change my business. And things will happen, obstacles will come, but you're moving towards the right direction. So set realistic goals, small goals, but do what you can with what you've got, but do it now. Don't don't wait for the perfect chair. Don't wait when you have to be home for a whole week. You can basically have a virtual office inside of your car. I think Zig Ziglar called it a university on wheels or a mobile unit. So <laughs> right. you can run your office. You can make calls. You can send emails. There's so much you can do. The big goal should be that tomorrow will be better than today. I like it. I'm, I'm a big believer in little hinges swing big doors. So that means you know, making small tweaks in your business really change the trajectory of your business and your life on a pretty quick time span. So you know, I'm very much you know, on board with what you just said there. So let's talk about mistakes that you see for small operators. What's the number one mistake you see a small operator make? Number one is lack of marketing. No lack question marketing. about it. Even if it's small initiative. Gotcha. Okay. And, and is it that the types of ads they're running? Is it just no marketing? What about lack of marketing? Explain no marketing. That. No marketing. No marketing. Basically, just from a 45 car operator that's been grown by word of mouth to a one car operator that does nothing, has a, a business card, and he doesn't understand that there's many things that can be done using innovation, technology, basic strategies, basic principles that will get him more customers. So, gotcha. Now, could it be as easy as you know mailing a, a handwritten thank you note and then following up with a monthly letter to his client, something simple like that? Absolutely. Okay. Are you a fan of using newsletters, print edition or, or digital? Yes, I am. Okay. And what, what else in, in marketing are you a fan of? What do you like and what do you suggest your clients do? It's so strange. And I have a customer from uh, Washington that mails 10,000 postcards a month and they get some business. I have a customer in Newport Beach that's uh, like 60 miles from LAX and he goes and hands flyers door to door. That's what I charge. And both of them are growing the same way. So it depends. Uh, if you're a small company, do the best you can with what you've got. If you have a flyer and you can't afford to buy a route from the post office to deliver within a certain neighborhood, then you call that homeowners association and say, I'm a small operator. May I put an ad on your, on your newsletter saying that I charge so much to the airport? And you're going to get business. There may be another company that they're going to do a radio plug that costs a lot more money. So little things throughout the course of the day. And But embrace marketing. Don't let it be a part of your business that's a distraction. Oh, I'm going to have to do that again. That's the only thing. That's the only variable that's going to set you apart from the big operators. Find ways to promote, create a marketing culture, even within your family. If the wife goes to a wedding, she sees somebody, well, when is the honeymoon? Do you need a car? You know, have your employees ask everyone. When you get a call for a reservation, try to upsell, sell, you know, Wi-Fi vehicles. Just create a culture. The guy that's washing your cars, he's going to remember that if I put that magazine, if the water is clean and all that, they may get another customer. So everyone has to embrace that and think, what is it that I am doing to grow this company, to make it better so that I, I can grow with the company and I can benefit from that as well. And that's all leadership. That comes from the management. And if they see that, the manager is hesitant to make a phone call. If they see that he's not spending time on marketing, why should they? You know. Gotcha. Okay, I like that, and I, and and I think it's important to remember that marketing should be seen as an investment, not as an expense. Something that you're looking to get a return on investment on, and once you get that return, you reinvest it into your marketing. So don't look at it as an expense. Look at it as an investment into your business, into your life, into growing yourself. It is the number so, one investment. It's the only one that's going to bring you more money. Absolutely. So let's take you into a time machine, and let's go back 20, 30 years, and you're sitting there talking with yourself. What would you tell yourself, knowing what you know now about business, what would you tell yourself as a young operator? That once you have a small business, you're going to grow, and things are going to get better. But you need to adapt. You need to change. You need to keep marketing your business. It may be a year that we call the mountain effect, that you got a lot of customers, you go all the way up to that mountain, you're busy, and then something happens, and you lose some customers, and then you go down that mountain again, and you got to start all over again. Let me look for another hotel. Let me look for another account. When the healthy thing is that keep marketing the whole time, even when you're busy. And I failed to do that. In the 90s, we would make a ton of money. We have a dozen limos here and there. So we thought, oh, things are just going to keep growing. But all of a sudden, you have more competition, in the 80s, there are 40 companies in Dallas. Now there's 400. So always keep thinking of ways to grow your business because if you don't, 
you're not going to keep the way you are. You're going to go backwards because competition is becoming more sophisticated. The entry level in our industry is low. You can buy a car and you can compete. And in order to compete and gain market share, some of these operators have to lower their prices. So uh, do not look at your bottom line. Do not look at your business if you're doing well or making money. But just keep in mind, I need to keep doing marketing. I need to keep gaining customers. Attrition rate is high. You know, customers will go here and there. But keep in mind that the only thing that's going to sustain you, that's going to help you, is to have the framework of a company that has a consistent marketing effort, regardless of the outcome, if you're slow or busy. That's great. So you'd say your secret sauce and your secret to success is is purely marketing and stick-to-itiveness? Well, marketing is one of the variables. I mean, if you do not have good quality, if you do not have good service to be able to gain that customer, develop that customer, and get referrals, then you're going to be spinning your wheels. But what I've learned at companies that have uh, good marketing, they have their well-structured company, always are companies that have good service. All right. So do you have any cool tips or tricks or strategies or anything like that you'd like to share? Well, in essence, what I tell the operator, the first thing is take a deep breath. Stop everything. Nothing will remain the same forever. And like I said, if some things have failed in the past, it's not you that fail. It's perhaps that strategy, that idea. So take a deep breath, think of yourself, give yourself as much value as you do to your customers, you know, and work out some sort of a plan or a goal that within six months, I'm going to, you know, be able to be home for the weekend. Within six months, I'm going to have a better ground support system that I'll have a little more peace of mind. But everything has to be backed up by action. Things are not going to change until you change. So look for help. Look for some marketing strategies. There are lots of information in the Internet, on YouTube. Talk to somebody like Ed that you know, knows a lot about this business. And try to implement small steps. Ed. Zig Ziglar used to say, hurricanes get all the publicity, but termites do more damage than hurricanes one little bite at a time. <laughs> no, disaster doesn't come in one step. It comes in bad judgment done every single day. It's the guy that drinks alcohol... For a week, nothing happens. He does it for a month, nothing happens. But if you keep drinking for two years, you'll be dead. So keep in mind, it doesn't take anything drastic or incredible to change your business. Just minor changes done on a day-to-day basis, which is you know, incorporate marketing, and you have a completely different outcome. And I wish everyone good luck. I have great passion for the industry. I know what this business can do for you, and I know the sacrifices that you have uh, to make in order to be successful. So my best to everyone, and thank you so much, Ed, for allowing me to be a part of this show. This was great. Thank you so much, Bruno. I really appreciate it. This has been a really informative and, and exciting interview. we got tons and tons of great information for the small and mid-sized operator in the industry. This has been great. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, just once again, good luck to everyone. Okay, and if people want to get a hold of you for some consulting or to have a chat, how would they get a hold of you? They can call our number, which is 817-825-8515, and we can set an appointment to give them a free marketing evaluation. Great, and the website address is limousineexpert.com. That All right, correct. Bruno, this was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Be able to gain that customer, <clears throat> develop that customer, and get referrals then you're going to be spinning your wheels. But what I've learned at companies that have uh, good marketing, they have their well-structured companies, AVS Media always demo. are companies that have good service. All right, so do you have any cool tips or tricks or strategies or anything like that you'd like to share? Well, in essence, what I tell the operator, the first thing is take a deep breath. Stop everything. Nothing will remain the same AVS forever. AVS Media demo. And like I said, if some things have failed in the past, it's not you that failed. It's perhaps that strategy, that idea. So take a deep breath. Think of yourself. Give yourself as much value as you do to your customers. You know, and work AVS out some Media sort of a plan demo. or a goal that within six months, I'm going to, you know, be able to be home for the weekend. Within six months, I'm going to have a better ground support system that I'll have a little more peace of mind. But everything has to be backed up by action. AVS Things are not going to change demo. until you change. So look for help. Look for some marketing strategies. There are lots of information in the Internet, on YouTube. Talk to somebody like Ed that you know, knows a lot about this business. And try to implement small steps. AVS Zig Media Ziggler used demo. to say, hurricanes get all the publicity, but termites do more damage than hurricanes one little bite at a time. 
You know, disaster doesn't come in one step. It comes in bad judgment done every single day. Is the guy that drinks alcohol for a AVS week, nothing Media happens. He does it for a month, nothing happens. But if you keep drinking for two years, he'll be dead. So keep in mind, it doesn't take anything drastic or incredible to change your business. Just minor changes done on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, you know, incorporate marketing, AVS and you Media have a completely demo. different outcome. And I wish everyone good luck. I have great passion for the industry. I know what this business can do for you, and I know the sacrifices that you have uh, to make in order to be successful. So my best to everyone, and thank you so much, Ed, for allowing me to be a part of this show. This is great. Thank you Media so much, Bruno. I really appreciate it. This has been a really informative and, and exciting interview. we got tons and tons of great information for the small and mid-sized operator in the industry. This has been great. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, just once again, good luck to everyone. Okay, and if people want to get a hold of you for some consulting AVS or Media chat, how would they get a hold of you? They can call our number, which is 817-825-8515, and we can set an appointment to give them a free marketing evaluation. Great, and the website address is limousineexpert.com. That's right. Media awesome. Thank you very much.